Well, happy 2018, my fellow babies. And I have to say, um, I actually am happy so far in 2018. I think it's turning out pretty well. Uh, we're glad you guys could join us for Pactor Factor on sifted.net. I am hopeful that you are watching this right upon release as a Patreon uh, patron and you are supporting sifted.net. If you are, thank you so much. If you're not, uh, well, I guess you're watching this a week later on YouTube. Our first question of 2018 comes from Sifted from Johnny Hurricane. What a great name. Switch had a great 2017 with Zelda and Mario. Now that both of those have launched, how can Nintendo keep the momentum going into 2018? Uh, you know, that's a really excellent question. I, I, I think that Mario and Zelda games, both of which received, I believe, a 97 Metacritic average score, and though I, I think I, I'd have to look this up, but I think there are five games in history that averaged a 97 on Metacritic. There might be 198. I'm not positive. It might be GTA 5. But anyway, but it, that's either 98 or 97. But there's like five games, and and another Zelda is among those. So when you launch two of the five best games of all time, you keep the momentum going just because those games keep selling. So. I would question the sanity of anybody who doesn't own a Switch yet, as of you know January 2018, who buys a Switch in 2018 and doesn't buy at least one of those games. And I get that not everybody likes the RPG style of Zelda, and not everybody likes a platformer kind of style of Mario, but those are pretty broad appeal type game you know designs, game styles. And unless you are only into shooting games or only into racing games, if you're only into shooting games, you're probably never going to buy a Nintendo Switch because you're just not going to get the, the variety on the Switch. Um, if you're only into racing games, well, you've got you know Super Mario Kart 8, so you've got something to play. Uh, the answer, though, to the question is, I, I think that Nintendo got its act together starting in around 2014, maybe early 2015, when the Wii U was flopping. And I think that the management team said, oh my God, you know, we screwed up. We put out a console that just doesn't work. So, you know, they, they went back and Mr. Iwata who, who passed away and I, again, respect and admire the man. I apologize again for anything derogatory I ever said. I don't think he was a good CEO, but maybe he was, maybe I missed something. They put the switch in motion and we didn't know about the switch when Mr. Iwata died. We didn't know exactly what it would be. I think they got their development in in order. I think they figured out we need to support the launch of our next device, which turned into the Switch in 2017, with a ton of good software and keep the momentum going. So my bias is, although not yet announced, there's a Smash Brothers title coming. And is it coming in 2018? I don't know, because those are really ambitious big games. But is it coming by a year from now, early 19? Yeah, I bet it does. Um, and, and there's other stuff. They could put a Pokemon title out. We're, we're probably going to get one of those. Do we care about Pokemon on the Switch? Well, as I've always said, Switch is really largely used as a handheld. I'd say more than half of game sessions are as a handheld. Yes, Pokemon's going to work on a Switch. So, you know, I'm very comfortable that with Mario and Zelda in the marketplace, with Mario Kart in the marketplace, and with at least a big game, a Pokemon, or Smash Brothers coming out, yes, momentum is sustainable. Um, the, the, the press release that surprised me, which came out a couple days ago, first week of January, um, that Switch sales in North America, you know, 4.8 million or something, uh, really great number. Um, when I saw that press release, it actually said, and I'm sure I'm gonna get the percentages backwards, but one of Mario or Zelda sold attached at 60% rate and the other at 55% rate. That surprised me. I mean, I thought they would attach at an 80 or 90% rate. And I get that neither game is for everybody, but my good goodness, why are you buying a Switch if you're not into Mario or Zelda? Like, what's the point? You know, I guess you have other games, you know, Arms is fun, Splatoon is fun. I mean, there's plenty of stuff to do. Um, Golf Story is fun, Stardew Valley is fun. I mean, there's a ton of stuff on there, but I can't imagine very many people bought a Switch just to play Golf Story, which by the way, is a great game. I get um, I get that not everybody buys it, but I think those, those games attach at a 60% rate 
for a long time. Um, take a look at how GTA 5 has attached to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. You know, you've got 80 some odd million, 85 million copies of GTA sold. Probably about 15 or so, maybe 20 on the old gen consoles. So 65 at least million on the next gen consoles. You've only got 70 million PS4s out there and you know maybe 35 million Xbox Ones. So out of 105 million combined next gen consoles, you have literally a 60% attach rate for GTA. Um, if GTA attaches at 60%, I gotta believe that Mario and Zelda to the Switch attach at a 75 or 80% rate. So I think they keep sales going for a long, long time, definitely through 18. Uh, question is just, you know, what happens in 2019, 2020? Um, do we, you know, Nintendo fans are, are a very committed lot, but a lot of people don't want to buy a console for 300 bucks unless it plays a lot of games like Call of Duty, like uh, Star Wars, like Assassin's Creed, and those games are not on the Switch. So, you know, Nintendo's done a really great job with third party. We're getting mostly older games. Uh, fortunately, the older games we're getting are like Elder Scrolls, are just really amazing, great games, Doom. Um, so, you know, people like those games. And I think they work really well. FIFA was on, NBA 2K was on, so you're getting some new games. But it, the tendency has been to take games that were made for the Xbox 360 and PS3 and port them over to the Switch. Games that are exclusively PS4, Xbox One uh, aren't showing up on the Switch. So, you know, I, I think that's going to become a, a smaller number in the future, not a bigger number. I think you get a lot of content from prior, prior years, you know, catalog, old library stuff, not a lot of new titles. Um, and so the question is, you know, do you buy a Switch only or do you buy a Switch as a supplement to the next gen console? I think the latter. Um, it's good for the Switch that the PS4 and Xbox One are dropping in price. I think you get a 199 for both of those consoles this year, kind of permanent price price cut. So for 500 bucks, you can get a Switch and one of the other consoles, and you can have any game you want. Um, if you like Nintendo content, you must own a Switch. So uh, I think that's how you keep the momentum going. The next question comes from Patreon from Chris Ross. What do you think about EA telling its investors that turning off Battlefront 2's microtransactions will not affect its earnings? It seems unlikely given how much of this revenue is generated by games like FIFA. Does EA's forecasting take microtransactions into account? My model uh, had for the December quarter, 25 million of microtransactions from Battlefront. Um, my model in the March quarter, so EA is on a March 31st fiscal year. So they're, they're, December is their third quarter, March is their fourth. Um, my model had 75 million for the March quarter. I understand from an investor that EA independently told investors in breakout meetings at conferences in December that their guidance included 35 million for the, for the December quarter and 65 million for the March quarter. So the same total for the fiscal year that I had, which uh, as I said, I'm like really smart. Um, that kind of shows that I had about the right cadence of microtransactions. Um, so turning them off in at launch, November 17th, absolutely cost EA $35 million to their guidance. Um, that's bad, but the good news is that their guidance is $2 billion, $2 billion uh, for the quarter. So 35 million is a tiny percentage. I mean, it's you know, one and a half, two percent. Um, my math is that just foreign currency translation gives them 80 million of tailwind, meaning that their revenue will be up by 80 million just because the stuff they sell outside the United States gets repatriated back at a higher, a higher foreign currency exchange rate. To make that simple, if you sell something in euros and the euro is at $1.20, then when you record the profit, you record $1.20 for every euro that you generate. If the euro rises to $1.30, then you record more revenue. And that's what's happened. The euro's gone up, the pound has gone up about 15, 16%. And so EA is going to generate a lot of revenue from that, more than enough to offset the 35 million microtransactions. Um, is it enough in the March quarter? No, but it's the first week in January. So they didn't say we're never going to have microtransactions in Star Wars. They said we are temporarily suspending the implementation. They will bring them back. The question is just when and what they bring back. 
My bias is they won't bring back pay to win microtransaction mechanics. They'll bring back cosmetic microtransaction mechanics. But you can do things like, you know, give people faster transport, you know, from planet to planet or places on the map. So I think you can do stuff like that. A teleporter in Star Wars is faster or different. Um, maybe some, you know, way to, to make your, your weapons stronger or, but without making them more powerful, make them more durable. I mean, plenty of stuff. Make, you can give people armor that's a little more resistant to damage, which is not necessarily pay to win. It might just be that you suck and you get shot, you get hit a lot. So, no, I think there's plenty of stuff these guys can do. I think you'll get that re-implemented in February. I think they'll get back a big chunk of the, the 65 million that they included in their guidance this year. And I think foreign currency takes up the rest. So the answer is, no, I don't think a microtransaction hit is going to impact earnings. I do believe EA is telling the truth. Um, yes, of course, the controversy over microtransactions means that self-purchases of Star Wars will be lower because the guys who buy the game for themselves tend to read reviews, tend to look at Reddit, tend to participate in forums and bitch and moan about how EA is a greedy you know, pick of the company. But, but the truth is that Star Wars is a big gift giver game. It launched into holiday, which is a big gift giver time. Ask your mom if she knows about microtransactions in Star Wars. And I'm gonna bet that she does not. Unless she's a hardcore gamer, she does not. So gift givers, I don't think were impacted at all. The last one sold 13 million units with a terrible Metacritic score, 72. This one got a worse Metacritic score, but I actually think the majority of the negative reviews, if you read them, they were based on microtransactions. Probably would have been 75, 77 without the microtransaction debacle, but gift givers didn't read it and they bought 13 million of them last time. Are they gonna buy 13 million this time? You know, EA is guiding to 14 for the year through March. We'll see. I mean, we're going to get NPD data soon. We'll see how, how the game did in December. My bias is they limp to their number, but they hit it and it doesn't impact earnings at all. Our last question this week before we get to Scott's lesson is from Patreon from Simon Wallace. Hey, Pack, what did you think of The Last Jedi? Personally, I thought it was awful, but opinions are all over the place. What was your favorite film of 2017? Oh, I know you're going to just freak out about this, but I haven't gone and seen The Last Jedi yet. And I, I should go see it. Um, it's funny, I meant to go see it last week, and my kids are out of school, and uh, one of the theater chains I cover, Cinemark, gives me a free pass with my name on it, so I can't transfer it. But me plus a guest, so my wife and I can go to movies for free anytime, and there's a really good Cinemark theater in Long Beach uh, at the Pike. Um, with recliners and they've got all the XD screens and stuff. It's really cool and I have no excuse. I can go free at any time. I've just been working and I shouldn't be working. I should be going and seeing Star Wars. So I don't know. Um, don't spoil it for me if you're going to post on, on Twitter. Um, I don't read. I've been reading anything about the, the movie. My favorite film, I did see a lot of movies this year. I just, for whatever reason, because Star Wars launches at holiday. That's the worst time in the world for me to go to the movies. I, I don't know why. It doesn't work for me. Um, and I actually might go today, except it's freaking NFL playoffs, so I don't know. Um, my favorite film this year, like by a lot, was Get Out. Um, now, I have to say, I kind of grew up in an era where racism was a bit more rampant or more overt. Um, it's making a comeback lately, but you know, with these marches in Charlottesville and stuff. But I, you know, I remember going to school uh, in the at the University of Florida, and I remember walking down the street, and I, there was a black guy walking toward me, and he stepped off the sidewalk, and as he passed me, I go, "Why did you do that?" There's plenty of room. He goes, "Because that's what we do in the South," and that blew me away. Like I, that just shocked me. So Get Out really resonated with me. I, I, I think. It's a really well done movie. I mean, it's a very clever plot. There's good twists in it. It's got a, I thought, a very good ending. Um, I loved it. So that probably is my number one. Uh, my number two, close. I really liked Wonder Woman, but I liked it, I think, more for just the how well it made, how good it made me feel. Like, I just thought she was a great heroine. The, the, the Gail Gadot is just the Gadot. It's just a great actress, and she, she played the role perfectly, and I thought it was a really compelling story. 
but I really loved Baby Driver. If you haven't seen that, I think that's probably R-rated. So if you haven't seen that um, and you're over 17, definitely see that movie. I don't think it's going to get nominated for anything, but it was just unbelievable. Highly recommended. And then the sneaky, stupid movie that I really liked, which I, I can't explain it, but I just thought it was freaking great, was Kong Skull Island. Um, shocking how much I love that movie. I've now seen it twice. And I have to say, again, it's probably because I'm a child of the 60s, but it's a throwback horror movie. I mean, not horror, a throwback monster movie. It's just a good old, you know, King Kong movie. We haven't had one of those in years. It's been done right. Um, Jordan Vogt Roberts is the director. He did a phenomenal job. I mean, it is just tight, well acted. The special effects are great. Um, I thought the story was really good. I, I liked everything about it, so I highly recommend that. Um, anything else? You know, again, like stupid stuff that I, uh, this is the kind of type of movies I like. John Wick too. Really liked it. I mean, you know, there were a lot. Uh, was Logan this year? Yeah, Logan. Logan. Wow. What a great movie. Um, Logan was, I'd say, close, probably ahead of Deadpool, but as the best Marvel Universe movie I've ever seen. And, and you know, the reason I think I like those two, I like the reality of the, the hero being a bad guy, you know, killing people. Um, I think that there's something, you know, that's that's actually resonates true about that. So those are what I like. Um, I would never have had Star Wars in my, in my favorite three just because I'm not that big of a Star Wars geek. Thank you, fellow babies, for joining us. Please follow me on Twitter at Michael Pactor. We will see you next week with more Scotch Revelations. Um, so I drink a lot of scotch, right? But when I say I drink a lot, I, I entertain a lot. Um, I go through a lot of bottles. Um, and so I read a tip on how to create something really cool. And the tip was find a decanter, and I have a couple of decanters, and take what's left over from your scotch bottle when you're right at the end and you have maybe just enough for one drink, you know, one ounce or less, and pour it into the decanter. And so I, I actually don't know how big this thing is. I assume it's 25 or 30 ounces. Um, and in, in fairness, I have actually drunk down some of it. But the, the technique is pour what's left into the decanter and you'll get a mix of a bunch of different scotches. And when you get to about two thirds full, drink down to about halfway and then start again. So I started doing this in March. It is now January. So it literally took me 10 months to get that full which means in 10 months, I probably went through 15 bottles of scotch or something. That's, that feels about right. That's probably exactly what we did. And one of the things I do, I'm not a creature of habit. I don't drink the same stuff every time. So I change up my scotches always. Um, and I do it just because it's fun. So when I buy scotch, I buy typically a case at a time, 12 different scotches. And so this had uh, the remnants of, you know, more, probably more than 15 bottles, probably 25 bottles. Um, I also host a Scotch and Cigar Dinner twice a year. And whatever's left over, I started doing this in March. Um, I pour it all into one bottle. So I blend it all. And then I pour an ounce of that some, once I poured in two. So I did that a couple of times as well, which is just a really interesting mix. So this came out, re it's really interesting, I have to say. And it it's actually kind of smoky. But What's cool about this is everything in it is single malt scotch. Um, so I've got really great mixes in here. And, you know, on, in, a, in the next episode, I'll talk to you about tasting it um, and how you should actually taste scotch. But single malt just means that all the whiskey in the bottle is from the same batch. It was all made the same time in the same process. Um, there are... There are blends of single malt that are not called blends, they're called single malt, that are exactly the same scotch made in exactly the same process, but what they do with scotch is they dump it into a cask when they're done. 
and then they let it mature in the cask. So sitting in the cask with the wood is when you read 12 year scotch, it is distilled and then put into the barrel for 12 years. So it takes 12 years in wood before they bottle it. So when you see 12 year, 18 year, 21 year, 25, 30, those are just in the cask that much longer. The blends that people are doing now are they will take scotches from different casks that are the same scotch. So McAllen has one, I've already forgot what it's called, not Signet, that's Glamorangi. Um, it'll come to me. Anyway, McAllen has a really expensive one, $275. And they take bits from a whole bunch of different casks. I think the earliest is 12 year old, the oldest is 30 and they blend those, but they were all made the same way. They're just different ages. Balvani has one called Tune, T-U-N, and then a different number. First one was 1401, the next one's 1509. And they blend, it's 200 gallons, and they'll put in you know, a quart or, or a pint from each of hundreds of different casks and blend it together. It's all the same scotch, just different years. So that's kind of a new thing, and that's actually what gave rise to the idea of putting the dregs in here. So everything is single malt in here. They're just different manufacturers. Um, the other companies that are making these blends, uh, I think Lefroig has one called Care Deus. There's a bunch of them. Um, those are different because they have no vintage statements. So they don't say 12 years or 18 because they're a mix. But anyway, you can get really creative with scotch. So I'm blending. Uh, in a future lesson, I'm going to teach you how to taste and teach you how to appreciate the different flavors. And I think that's going to be it. I'm not advocating the violent overthrow or putting our, our leaders on toilet paper. I'm just, oh, which I think I have right here, by the way. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. But, but it is pretty funny. You got to admit it's funny, but, but I don't, but don't hate me because I have a different view than you. Cause I got to say, seriously, I probably have a different view than you about a lot of things.